for your introduction. And uh, Leo is also on this committee that he referred to. I'm a co-chair of the committee. I'm not chair of the committee, co-chair, others. Um, and it is a, a fundraising uh, committee that was struck uh, pr pr primarily because of the International Year of Cooperatives. At least the timing was certainly related to IYC and uh, as is the, uh, the uh, sequence of uh, lunch and learns that you're having tied to IYC. And I've got my little pin on here I want to point out just to prove that I'm aware of, uh, of the importance of the International Year of Cooperatives. Um, this, is, this presentation uh, is about the Cooper Cooperative Development Foundation, and you see CDF, and that's what that stands for. Uh, based out of Ottawa, they are. It's a Canadian national organization, but their office is in Ottawa. Building a Better World is the name of the campaign, the fundraising campaign that we're, we've embarked on. Um, and I am very, very pleased to have been invited to make this presentation to you. Uh, the last time I made a presentation in this room, I probably would have been an employee information session with me as CEO, so uh, it, it does feel markedly different to be here in a, in a kind of an instructor role or something, and I haven't had a lot of practice at that, being a teacher. So I'm going to try to um, teach something here today about the CDF. I'm going to try to simplify it. I'm not only going to talk about fundraising. In fact, that will be the minimalist part of my presentation, will be the fundraising. The, the most of it is about the CDF and about my partner in crime here, Leo and I, who had the great opportunity to travel this winter to, uh, to Peru, actually, uh, on behalf of the CCA, the Canadian Cooperative Association, which is the uh, partner of the CDF. All the CAs and the CCAs and the ACAs and the CCCs and the CCA, they all get confusing, I find. So I'm going to try to, to simplify that. We'll see how we make out. Uh, up in the top left-hand corner, you see the logo for the Canadian, uh, the Cooperative Development Foundation of Canada, the CDF. On the right, you see the logo for the International Year of Cooperatives. Um, and here's the mission of the CDF. It says, the cooperative, this slide says, the Cooperative Development Foundation of Canada raises funds in support of cooperative and credit union development programming to reduce global poverty working in partnership with the Canadian Cooperative Associations. That's kind of a mouthful, but, but it does bring two or three things to the front, uh, one of which is the CDF we're here to talk about, which is the acronym for the Cooperative Development Foundation of Canada. I know I've said that about five times and I'll continue to emphasize it, but don't get confused between the CDF and the CCA. They are virtually one and the same organization. And I remember uh, many years ago, somebody came to an AGM or, or something and spoke on this same topic and it was on behalf of the CDF. I remember being ever so confused. I'm saying, what's the connection between the CDF and the CCA? Like, who, who is who here? Like, do they work together? Are they working apart? Are they, does the one own the other? Uh, don't allow your brain to do that to you. They're virtually one and the same. The CCA is the Canadian Cooperative Association. The CCA uh, does a great deal of domestic work on behalf of cooperatives nat nationally, domestic work. Uh, so that means not international, that means Canadian cooperative development work. They do a great deal of that, the CCA does. They also have an international development department. The international development department component of the CCA uh, gets funding from a foundation called the, the Cooperative Development Foundation of Canada. So the CDF, all it does is raise money. That's all they do. But you have to be a foundation in order to get the tax uh, benefit, in order to be recognized by Revenue Canada. There's various rules, regulations that apply. So it was merely set up as the vehicle for raising money to fund, for the most part, the International Development Program of the CCA. So they're sort of the same thing. So don't allow yourself to get confused. I'm here to talk about the International Development component only. I'm not talking about the rest of what uh, the CCA does. Now, and that's why it keeps coming back to the CDF, because most of the funds raised by the CDF do go into the International Development Program. The CDF tends to be synonymous with uh, international development, cooperative development in the developing world. CDF was established in 1947, so it's been around for a good long time. It is a nationally registered charitable organization, so if you give money to the CDF, like any, 
uh, charitable organization, you do get a tax credit for that donation. Uh, we raise, on average, through donations, uh, approximately $1.3 million per year, which is the more or less the current operating budget uh, of the CDF. And here's where it gets really interesting and fun, is the CDF is able to leverage those funds with CEDA, which is the Canadian International Development Association, which is a government outfit, and I'm sure you're familiar with CEDA. Uh, CEDA matches those, one, those funds, the $1.3 million, three to one. So every dollar turns into four dollars, in effect. You give a dollar, the government puts in three, you now have four. Um, and those four dollars then go to support CCA projects around the world. And that's the way it works. Um, I've uh, taken, uh, so those first two slides actually came from the CDF. I've added some of my own just to, again, to do what I think is simplifying it, but I may be complicating it. But Another thing that I've found confusion, confusing over the years is just the who, what, where, when, and why of international development. For example, under who, um, you hear these terms. People throw these terms around, like CETA. I just threw CETA into my previous slide, and I talk about CETA like everybody knows exactly what CETA is. Well, maybe they don't, and certainly everyone doesn't know what CCA is or CDF. So I, I, in my mind, anyway, I think you can break it into two general groups when it comes to international development. The WHO are either government organizations like CETA, which is a Canadian development agency, that's a government organization, uh, gov government managed, government funded, of course. P in the U.S. they have an organization called the Peace Corps, which you may or may not have heard of, but the Peace Corps also does development projects throughout the world, not cooperative development projects, development tro projects, period. They might be cooperative. Uh, those are government organizations, but then there's another big group of organizations called non-government organizations, and these typically are referred to as NGOs. And you see that every time you read a, a newspaper article on international development, somebody is talking about NGOs doing this and NGOs doing that, and they just assume everybody knows what an NGO is, and you probably do, but just on the off chance that you might be slightly confused by it, I'm trying to simplify it. Uh, an NGO is a non-government organization. It's that simple. It's nothing more complicated than that. And I've listed three. There's hundreds of them. I've listed three from a huge uh, NGO called the Red Cross, which everyone has heard of. The Red Cross is international. It's global. It's all, all around the world. There's also, of course, a Canadian branch of the Red Cross. For all uh, its importance, politically, the Red Cross is a non-government organization. Administratively, it is not. Uh, managed by government, is managed internally by itself. Red Cross is an NGO. Uh, a, that's a huge one. A, a smaller one, still a big one, is one called the CHF here in Canada, which is, is was formerly called the Canadian Hunger Foundation. Um, uh, I put that in because there's a partnership between the CHF and the uh, CCA, CDF, sometimes in international development work, so we do have some commonality with them. Uh, CHF is interesting. It, it, I put in formally called the Canadian Hunger Foundation because it's no longer called the Canadian Hunger Foundation, but it is continued to be called the CHF. Something like CUSO, another non-government organization. CUSO, who I'm sure most of you have heard of, uh, stands for Canadian University Students Overseas. That was what it originally stood for. Not anymore. CUSO is far more than just university students overseas. It's all kinds of projects that aren't university inspired. So CUSO is still their name, but it doesn't stand for Canadian. Same thing with the Canadian Hunger Foundation. It doesn't matter a, a, a bit whether you uh, remember or understand about the Canadian Hunger Foundation and their name. It's simply that they are a rather big one in Canada com compared to ourselves. The Canadian Cooperative Association slash CDF, that's who I'm here to talk about. We are a Canadian NGO, and we're rather small compared to the others. What do these organizations do? Well, they get involved in short-term emergency relief uh, when there is a disaster, like you, you, we rec they recently had in Haiti, for example, the earthquake in Haiti or the tsunamis that hit the, the Far East. Uh, they need emergency relief, and the Red Cross obviously would be an example of one that hits the ground early and provides that emergency relief. That's not what we do. It's not what the CCA slash CDF does. Then there's medium term, rebuilding infrastructure. They're still rebuilding in uh, Port-au-Prince in Haiti, for example, and likely will be for years to come. Typically, that's not what we do either. What we do is more long term in the third category here. 
It's more related to lifestyle, uh, things that we get involved in are agriculture, financial, uh, technology with agriculture, helping to improve the technology in these, in these countries where the agriculture can be extraordinarily uh, basic. Uh, we are able to bring some modernization that's uh, useful to uh, many of these countries, and I'll explain one of those projects in a minute. Uh, credit unions, microcredit, um, there was a fellow not long ago, I should know his name, involved with banking, not credit unions, not co-op, but he uh, received a, uh, a uh, um, Nobel Prize for his work with microcredit. Uh, credit unions invented microcredit in the third world. And most people don't realize that because, once again, we're small and we don't uh, promote ourselves aggressively enough or sufficiently enough, but we invented uh, a small loan, microcredit, and continue to work very successfully. So typically we're involved um, in areas where uh, there's, you could consider it long time, where, when. I'm saying once again disaster areas, war, weather, war causes uh, disaster, of course, weather, natural causes. But in, in the, the, the bottom categories where we find ourselves, the continuing needs of the developing world, that is typically where you would find the, the CCA, CDF doing their good work. The only time we would get involved in rebuilding would be if some of our uh, projects were damaged by a natural disaster, which did happen um, in Indonesia and uh, Sri Lanka when the uh, tsunami hit how many years ago that was now, time flies by, uh, but there were uh, dozens and dozens of credit unions that literally their offices were washed out to sea, and the CCA, CDF did get involved in helping to reestablish their physical, uh, physical uh, housing office uh, uh, assets so that they could get back in business. We take everything into account, politics, language, culture. Gender is a big one, even though I, haven't, I don't have it written here yet, but it does certainly appear. Uh, but we also need to be welcome. We don't force our, ourselves on anybody. Typically, we are invited to, uh, to help, um, and uh, typically it, it happens when funds are available to do so. Why? This is by no means an exhaustive list. This is just a list of some of the reasons why people, organizations, get involved in, in uh, third world developing development projects. Genuine altruism, altruism, which is a, a, a need to give. Charity is a similar uh, thing. Business opportunities, there are business opportunities that can be created through um, development projects in the third world. Excitement, see the world. QSO certainly was a lot of, of, about that. Uh, just the opportunity to get out and, and uh, see bigger parts of the world. Encourages some people. Politics is a big motivator when it comes to international development. Uh, politically correct, it is the politically correct thing to do. Uh, cultural, religion, opportunity, sharing the wealth. Uh, there is, as we know, a terrible imbalance in the world between the richest and the poorest. This is an opportunity to uh, correct somewhat that imbalance. Those are general reasons, but why cooperatives? Why would cooperatives be particularly good uh, at developing development projects in the third world, especially these long-term projects that I'm speaking about? Here's some explanation of that. Through community-owned businesses, cooperatives have been building local economies and alleviating poverty for hundreds of years. This is a fact. It's certainly a fact in Canada. Cooperatives have been operating for hundreds of years. But in other parts of the world, too, and this is something you may not know as, as, as clearly as, as, let's say, I do, because I have seen them, visited them, but all kinds of these, these countries throughout the world, these developing countries, there are cooperatives already in existence. There, there are people who know the value of working together um, and have been doing so for many, many, many years. Uh, thus, the partnership, the match between those cooperatives working in the developing world uh, and Canadian cooperatives is, is quite, is, is considerably easier. The match is considerably more uh, easy to put together simply because it's, it's co-op to co-op. Co uh, so today, we are able to bring the Canadian cooperative model to the developing world to help people create their own community-owned path to prosperity. Here's where, uh, where gender does enter into it. Uh, all projects with the CCA slash CDF, these projects must involve women, they must involve youth, and they must strive to be environmentally sustainable. So the standards are fairly strict when it comes to gender and youth and environment. Um, that's that, you know, you could talk all afternoon on item number three, which I don't intend to do. Uh, um, 
impact of cooperative development, just take this with however many salt, uh, dollars worth of salt it is, um, because it's impossible to remember this, but over the past four years, CCA's work, work has touched over 5 million people in 24 countries throughout Asia, Africa, and the Americas. CCA has worked with more than 4,000 cooperatives, creating 169 new co-ops and strengthening others. This work has created 112,000 new jobs, over 68,000 women and 44,000 men around the world have been able to generate income through CDF-supported co-ops. Uh, statistically, you can see it is very active and very busy, and we seem to be having some success. The monies used to uh, fund this cooperative development all would have been raised through the Cooperative Development Foundation and matched by CEDA. This is just a, just putting a, a, a map, a picture of where these projects typically occur, um, and they typically occur in the Caribbean, in the uh, in the in certainly in Central America, the Caribbean. Uh, Leo and I, our trip to Peru on the uh, west coast of South America, a uh, fair amount of activity there. Africa, uh, parts of Africa, off and on everywhere. Very busy in in Sri Lanka and parts of India as well and really busy here in Indonesia and in this part of the Far East. Um, clearly, it's, it's the band in the middle where the warm weather is that, uh, that uh, we find ourselves working um, in. Seldom has there been a project either north or south of the two, uh, two uh, trop cancer trop Capricorn. Why support inter international development at all? That can be a question to an individual or a question to an organization. Why bother? And one answer would be the world is simply too small for us to close our eyes to what is happening beyond our borders where millions of people are one illness, one flood, one theft, one drought away from going hungry or from losing their homes. That would be a compelling reason to support international development. There are other reasons, of course. Uh, the list that I gave um, suggested business opportunities would be another reason for supporting international development. But here's a, a compelling one that often drives uh, our charitable instincts. Um, I'm now going to show a few pictures of uh, various projects, uh, and I'll get to the one that Leo and I uh, went on, because I, 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 most of my pictures apply to that trip, because they're very familiar to he and I. Um, Here's, here's a neat picture, a neat project. This is in El Salvador, which is in Central America, of course. Um, with CDF's assistance, a cooperative of formerly landless peasants now produces 60% of El Salvador's cashews. This young man is picking a cashew. Well, that's what that device is for, is to, is to grab that ripe fruit. How many people here know what a cashew fruit looks like? Like, really, how many have seen one? Cashew is the only fruit whose seed, pit, uh, exists or occurs on the outside of the fruit. Um, this picture doesn't show it very well, but this little knob down here is the actual nut. That if you were to buy a cashew nut, now you still have to break the shell. When you buy cashews, the shell has been broken, and what you're getting is the soft core. Of the of the sh of the knot, the same as when you get Christmas knots, you have to break them open, right? Cashew is the same thing. Uh, it needs to be roasted. That little thing. So every nut, <clears throat> there's only one. So when you're tossing cashews down, every time you eat a cashew, there's a whole fruit that produced that 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 nut, that pit, that seed. Yes, it is, and yet typically in this world. We don't. They don't. It hasn't been processed. Now you got you have somebody working here who has a huge amount of experience with, with uh, processing the fruit into preserves and into various other edible products. And that is Romeo. Romeo, in his time in Africa, most of his energy and most of the projects he worked on uh, was using the fruit. So it's no longer wasted in that case. But typically, it is wasted. So it's a resource that is available, readily available, and very edible, very tasty, and it is now being developed. And that's what this is about. They're not only producing the cat, this project is also trying to take advantage of this fruit. Now, it's not as big as it looks. That picture is kind of out of proportion. It's, it's smaller than that. Not a great big thing. Um, 
Yeah, that's it's exactly the size of a pear. Yeah, it's exactly the size of a pear. And the nut on the end of it is is the size of a cashew. Um, and of course they come in various sizes. They're not all identical sizes. Um, but all nuts are like that. We don't necessarily realize it, but they all uh, come with a fruit. And some of them have more than one nut and some of them have one. Like an almond, for example, comes inside of an almond fruit and there's just one pit in there and that's the nut. You've got to have a lot of almond fruits to get a bag full of almond. Anyway, I'm not here for talking about <laughs> that, that component. That's getting way off track. But it's kind of interesting to, to think that every time you eat a, a, a cashew, there's a, a whole fruit that goes into making it. Uh, another project to where we're bringing agriculture and financial cooperatives together, uh, it's in northern Uganda uh, to improve farming income and to heal the scars left by decades of conflict. Um, that becomes very important because we're not in there as an emergency organization um, in the immediate aftermath of a war, but of course the scars last for many, many years. A uh, project in Ghana that I just had some photos of, it's a, a fishery co-op, a fish co-op, like sardines, they're processing. Uh, and they have a store now as a result of this project where they sell supplies, and a little office building where they're able to, to do some laboratory testing and that sort of thing. Uh, just helping them uh, get a fruit up here was a women's cooperative in Malawi. It's also in Africa where they were processing local fruits. Um, I actually had two trips this winter on behalf of, uh, on behalf of the CCA CDF, one to Colombia uh, and one to Peru. This is a slide from my Colombia mission, and, and this is fascinating to me. Uh, we are way, way, way up in the mountains here, like miles into the mountains where nobody could go unless they had a guide um, and a four-wheel drive that got stuck, uh, couldn't make it. We had to walk to get to these people. This uh, good-looking fellow here and this good-looking lady there, her husband and wife, they are the farmers. They live in, these, in this place way back in the middle of nowhere. The guy on the right was our translator. And the guy in the middle is a, is a cooperative leader. He's a farmer. He's a cooperative leader. He doesn't live near these two, but uh, he knows them very well. And he, um, in Colombia, you may recall that uh, a lot of the cocaine, a lot of the drug that finds its way to North America uh, is grown in Colombia. And that's where the Medellin cartel uh, exists and where war has actually been fought with the legal government over the drug trade. It's been a, it's been a really bloody um, existence. And these farmers, are, are they, 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 they call themselves peasants. And in our culture, to call somebody a peasant is kind of an insult. But what they mean by peasant is, is farmer. And, and the rich farmers, there aren't very many of them, I guess because they are very borderline from a, from a financial point of view. Um, they, uh, and these peasant farmers um, were forced to grow coca, it's called, coca, which was then used to pro be processed into cocaine. Uh, they were forced in two ways. One is when you're a farmer, you grow the crop that you're able to sell, and there was a demand, and there was no demand for some of the other crops that they could produce. Um, and uh, but the other reason is they did it at the point of a gun and I was in a conference in fact I spoke at a conference at the same conference that this fellow with the white t-shirt um, in the middle the, the co-op leader he spoke and he talked to his fellow farmers at this conference there were two or three hundred of them there small small farmers and he said um, there are alternatives there are other crops that we can grow and the alternatives are typically things like coffee and chocolate and, and sugar and that sort of thing flowers these, these this young couple here uh, sell a lot of flowers and if you check the source of flowers here in Moncton you'll find that a lot of them are coming from Colombia these days um, and he said uh, it's it's I forget how he worded it but financially it's very very tough but it could never be as bad as farming at the point of a gun and imagine having to having to do certain things because these drug lords ordered you to and this man if you look closely, you'll see he's standing, leaning on a crutch, and one of his legs was terribly damaged. I don't know the truth of it, but the, 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 the rumor, the story that circulated around was that he had defied the drug lords at one point and had been shot in the leg 
uh, as a result of that defiance on his part, uh, and hence he, he walks with a crutch because his leg was, was shot. It, it, I, it, it sounds true to me, it seems true to me, but I don't know that as a fact, but what I do know as a fact is that is the sort of existence they had. The American government, the Canadian government, various, uh, certainly the Colombian government has made great progress in getting away from the drug trade, and one of the things they've asked the, the, the NGOs of Canada to do is to get in there and help them find alternatives, which is something that the CCA is able to do. Uh, working with these people, we are helping them to grow something other than, other than um, coca for cocaine, and it's getting a huge amount of attention. So here's a picture of, of up in the mountains with farmers. I was there. Here's a picture down in the city of Bogota where we, where we met a lot of the community leaders. Believe it or not, there are a number of farmers in this room as well. They put their suits on and come to town and they look considerably different. Uh, there's the Canadian group is in there, and if you look really closely, you can see me there peeking out. That just proves I was there. Is that who? Dave, Dave yeah, Dave Sitterham is there, yeah, yeah, he was there. Two or three others from the CCA. Uh, this woman here is the, uh, is the CEDA representative in Colombia, a uh, very important woman. This fellow here is the Canadian ambassador. Uh, this, there were several professors there, academics, teachers, um, and all of these people committed to uh, assisting with the development of agriculture and alternative crops, the copa. So it was kind of neat, kind of neat, it's kind of fun to be involved, um, and a wonderful part of the world, truly. And then we get to Peru, and here I have some, some, some interesting pictures. Uh, Peru, uh, CD, it is, there, is, there are CDF funded projects in Peru improving the productive capacity of food processing plants such as coffee and cacao, which is chocolate, uh, and sugar, and various other things, including canola, which this fellow is holding. Uh, he's growing canola up in the mountains somewhere. Typically they're up in the mountains in these countries because it's cooler there. It's too hot down at sea level to grow many of these uh, plants. And this is a fellow by the name of Elvis Pizarro and he's uh, showing off his first crop of canola. Uh, this is a, Leo and I got there a day early and we had a chance to tour uh, Lima, Peru. We're in Peru now. And today we're not working on behalf of the uh, CCA, CDF. Today we're on holidays, Leo and I in, in Lima, Peru. This is a picture of me making friends with a fellow on the street, um, which I tend to do. And this is a picture of Leo making friends with the cops. <laughs> I was so tired of seeing this, seeing this picture. I, I just love this picture. I mean, these guys are formidable looking. They're everywhere. One of the ways that they've been able to bring some peace to the to the to the country, of both Peru and uh, and uh, Colombia, is they have a very 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 uh, prevalent police and force and army, um, and they're everywhere. They're around every corner, and they're not unpleasant unless you do something stupid. Um, and somehow or another, these four guys were standing there, you know, looking serious, looking like they were ready to go to, ready to fight. And Leo got chatting with them and then asked if they'd mind taking a picture. And that's what happened. So we had a little bit of fun, Leo and I. Uh, I threw in a few pictures just to, sh just to remind everyone. This was, we were in a museum, and this was a picture of a fragment of cloth that had been woven, you know, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, pre Columbian. This has been, woven prior to 1492, let's say. And I don't know if it can be true or not, but they say this, this piece of cloth, this fragment of cloth, has, has more strands per square inch than other, any other piece of cloth in the world. Something like that. Whether that's true or not doesn't matter either. It, it just means there's a, it's a very, very intricate piece of weaving. Um, this tree, this is an olive tree, and they say that that tree was planted uh, in in and around 1492 when the, when the Spanish first arrived uh, in that part of the world in the late 1400s and that tree has been there ever since and whether it was planted then or not I don't know but that it was one old tree still bearing uh, still bearing fruit the olives were on it we could see them um, just interesting stuff you see there it's an old culture they've been there a long time this is a really it's not a great slide maybe but I'm not even sure what you can see can you see that um, what it is, is we're, we're dining now, Leo and I, which we did a lot of too. Um, this is a glass of black 
juice made from black corn. And that's what that is. They brought that out to show it to us. It's a black cob of corn, black in color. And somehow or another, they refine that into a very popular juice. Here, the plate, which you don't see all that clearly, there's these little white nuggets. Well, that's white corn. And behind the white corn is a little sandwich uh, type of fare, which actually was potato salad. Um, and those of you who know me uh, and have heard me speak have heard me talk about potatoes. And you've heard me say that the potatoes originally were developed and bred in the uh, Andes, in the South America, in places like Peru. Um, and truly, the potato originated there. It didn't originate in Europe, as most people think. It originated in South America and was brought back to Europe by the Spanish and the various other European uh, uh, nations that invaded, in effect, North America um, and, uh, and hauled the stuff back to Europe. And the potato was one of them. Well, that was a potato salad type dish. It didn't look all that great, but boy, it tasted good, didn't it, Leo? When we dug into that, it was good. And the little white pieces of corn were nice and soft and tasty and the juice was okay. I think it's an acquired taste. Um, uh, this is something else. Um, this is a fruit that we came across. So we asked, what is that fruit? I wondered if it was a guava. It looks something like a guava, but it's not a guava. It is a lucuma. Lucuma. And so what do you do with lucuma? Well, they make ice cream out of it. And the chances are you have tasted lucuma. I can't think where, but we, t we, we found a place that served, <laughs> this is a funny table because we have the ice cream you see there is Lucuma ice cream. It's the flavor, it's very, very, it's a nice flavor, it's a very unique flavor, it's a special flavor, it's not like anything else, it's like itself, and I've tasted it before. We, we, we couldn't figure out where we had eaten it before, but I read up on it since then, and it's used worldwide for flavoring all kinds of different uh, things like ice cream and yogurt and that sort of thing. Um, there's three items on the table there, three food items that none, none goes with the other. The one on the far right is a hot sauce, which we were dabbling into, which normally you wouldn't eat with ice cream. The one in the middle is the national alcoholic drink called a Pisco Sour, which is made from raw egg. What else goes into it? Some sort of liquor. I forget. Was it rum? I don't know. I can't remember. doesn't matter. Raw egg is part of it. Um, so we had a, a bowl of ice cream, a pisco sour, and a, and a bowl of hot sauce for for our afternoon. Then, <coughs> um, this was a plant we went to, a factory in effect that we went to. It's called Co-op Norandino, and this is one of those co-ops I was referring to that exist in the developing world. This is a big co-op. It's a it's a second tier co-op like like Co-op Atlantic, and the member co -op, the members of Co-op Norandino are smaller. Co-ops, and they're listed down here. Uh, uh, Sepa Cafe was one that we visited. So they do various things: uh, producing coffee, producing sugar, producing uh, chocolate, and that sort of thing. And they, these smaller farmer-owned cooperatives, belong to the bigger Co-op Norandino, just as the smaller retail cooperatives belong to Co-op Atlantic here. Same structure. Uh, we went inside this plant, and. Uh, that here, what they're doing here is uh, uh, sorting and grading and bagging um, coffee for shipment to North America. Those bags you see in the back are uh, bags that are ready for shipment uh, to North America. And Brian, you would have been interested. When I walked, this is a mill. This is a mill, like an elevator. And when I walked in, the smell, even though it was coffee, not feed, the smell was just exactly like the smell in one of our mills. Uh, here in Canada. It just had that dusty smell to it, which is not, <laughs> was meant to be a good thing. Um, I put Just Us Coffee, and I have to be clear here, please don't, uh, Just Us does not know that I'm using their logo, so I'm, I'm telling them on video here that I, I, I beg their forgiveness for using their logo. The only reason I'm using Just Us is if you were to go into their back shop, Just Us Coffee, in fact any coffee maker who, who trades uh, in fair trade coffee and they buy their coffee from uh, Central or South America, it comes in these big bags and if you went into the back shop of Just Us where their raw material is, you would see these big 200 pound jute bags full of coffee beans ready to be ground, ready, ready to be roasted, ready to be ground. 
Um, I thought that was kind of neat because this product comes from these farms up in the mountains, and I'm going to show a picture here shortly. Um, these farms up in the mountains, and the farmers are so small, they only produce like one bag of coffee because they only have a few trees. But there's thousands and thousands and hundreds and hundreds of these small farms, and when they all put their one bag or two bags or three bags together at a central facility such as this, it makes a significant amount of coffee, which is then prepared, ready for shipment to North America, to organizations like Just Us Coffee. Switch gears here. This was a, an old creamery that somebody had built, probably some <laughs> NGO in the past had built this creamery. It was actually located at the university, and it was literally designed in the first place for, for making, for processing cream uh, and various other dairy products, but it had, had fallen into disuse. And this cooperative that we're dealing with is now using parts of this, mach this machinery for making uh, jams and jellies. Now this is a pretty poor picture, but this, if you could read it, you would see that uh, these are these are containers full of jams and juice. There's papaya, there's passion fruit, there's various other types of fruit in here, and we're helping them. We're we're helping the coffee producers. We're helping the the uh, these producers. Here's an interesting picture. This I'm going to pass this around. This belongs to Leo, not to me. But those, these are uh, chocolate beans. These are cacao. Um, uh, beans and there's, there's every language has another way of pronouncing cacao. Um, what is it in French? Cacao. 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 So pretty close. Uh, what you're looking at there, um, and that's what chocolate is made from. Like all chocolate in the world comes from those beans. Now, here we go again. Those beans uh, don't grow on trees. Those beans, well, they do, but they grow in a, a fruit. And the, the cacao, cacao fruit is the size, bigger than a pear, it's the size of, oh, an overgrown cucumber or a zucchini, you know, mid-sized zucchini, um, and it has many seeds. It doesn't just have one, it has many, and when they take those seeds out, that's when they take the seeds out of the, the fruit, that's what they have left, that's what's coming around in the bag, and then those seeds, various things are done to them. What you're seeing here, this was a neat little tool in the lab, um, is a, a, a kind of a guillotine affair, and you put the seeds in one at a time into that little machine, um, and then you cut them end for end, and you can see the insides of the seeds. So I, we've done that. In fact, I operated that machine and sliced them in half, and you can see the inside. And an interesting thing uh, happens here. When you look, if you can see it, I don't know why we didn't turn the lights off in here. I need to see these slides easier. There, that's better. Oh, because of the video. Oh, so you learned a lot back up. Sorry. Uh, good answer. Um, you you'll notice that some of the some of the cacao uh, beans, if they are called beans, uh, are white, and that apparently is very rare in places of the world where uh, cacao grows, where chocolate grows on trees. Um, you normally don't get many white beans. In this case, there are many white beans, and all of a sudden they have uh, something unique about their chocolate, about their beans that is different from everyone else's, and they'll pay a premium. The world will, chocolate producers will pay a premium for this white chocolate. On the right-hand side is merely a picture of chocolate that was made in that same lab uh, directly from the beans on the left and made these little chocolate nuggets, and they just squeezed the nuggets into little, um, formed them up into little candies, and. Uh, and it was as good as any chocolate you would ever get anywhere. So I ate that. No, it'll, it tastes horrible. It tastes horrible. Hard to believe it turns into the chocolate. Now, it takes a lot of sugar <laughs> uh, before it turns into chocolate. So then we, Leo and I, headed up into the mountain. We drove for four hours to get here. And then we drove for another hour to get beyond this, this bridge that crossed the raging river. And then we walked, and this is one of or several of our group walking up into the mountains again uh, to get to these, to one, or to get to a community. Uh, this is a sort of a typical home where, the, where they live. And, and you know, they're, they're, they're poor people. There's no question. They don't have any money to, to spend. Uh, certainly their affluence is, is zero compared to most people in this part of the world. But but they're not unhealthy, they're not unhappy. They certainly have an existence, and they're trying an existence that they cherish. They love it there, because they were 
born there. And that's where that's their home. Um, there are two little children, you can say, or maybe there's three there, um, and uh, various farm animals and whatnot. It's it's not a, a resort sort of quality place, that's for sure. But it is their home, and there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. And we made it up to the community. We walked and walked and walked. It was raining, and then the sun would come out, and then we had a co-op meeting. Uh, <laughs> I just I find I'm glad I got a chuckle out of you because they just like here they started talking and everybody in the room had to take a little turn giving a little speech and a little chat and making sure that they were heard the guy who is in the middle there the shorter fellow he was the leader of the local co-op in that particular uh, community uh, and this was just one part of the room there's all kinds of people to the left and there's all kinds of people to the right um, and there were many women and younger people in the room. I can say, although there's not much evidence of it there, there's a couple of women on the right-hand side. I don't see too many youth. The, the young fellow, a good-looking guy on the left there, the young fellow, that was the mayor, I think, of the town. He was the guy that got up and promised a new road. Uh, you know, sound familiar? Um, <laughs> that was, it was really neat. This was, and they had these tiny little, so I have some good pictures here of sugarcane production, and this brings it right from, you know, just think about coffee and chocolate and flowers and all these other things, canola, there's all kinds of things going on, but bring it down to one product. And this is kind of, this is understandable. I think you'll get this. Um, th this is a very small field of sugarcane, way up in the mountains. It's just, it's just more like a garden than a field. But if you've ever seen sugarcane, you'll know that's what you're looking at here. That's cane. And <clears throat> in the old days, they would, when the sugarcane was mature, they would harvest it with a knife of some sort, and the stalk of the sugar cane is, is like that big around probably, and about that tall. And they would bring it into this, to this uh, old system of grinding it. And in this case, it's a some sort of a bull, a cow uh, that walks round and round and round, and you don't see it clearly, but that cow has a has a hole, a trail worn in the mud that's that deep, where he's been walking, and he turns the the grinding wheel, the metal grinding wheel that's in the middle of this apparatus, and these people on the ground feed the, the cane, the stalks of cane, into that, and the, when they squeeze it and break it, uh, juice comes out. And they collect the juice and they make it into sugar. Uh, and it works, and that's the way it's been done for hundreds of years. Uh, you can also see the clothes are hanging there and various other things. It was a rainy season. Um, Clearly, hygiene isn't high on their on their list of things to worry about in this particular operation. Um, they're only making pennies on this. It, like quality, is, it's not a particularly good quality. Um, one of the problems is it makes a really good uh, uh, moonshine, and they they couldn't make any money selling the sugar. They were because the sugar was dirty and the quality just wasn't there. And nobody wanted to buy it. Uh, they typically would make a lot of alcohol and. And they did have a market for that, and uh, of course that brought its own list of problems. So these communities, you know, they, they had something going there, but it wasn't going very well. And enter the CDF, the CCA, and we helped them buy this machine, which, you know, in Brian's new feed mill is, wouldn't, wouldn't really be a marvel of, of uh, mechanical advantage, but in this community, They'd never seen anything like this before. So now, instead of every little household grinding up their their sugar cane in a dirty fashion, uncontrolled fashion like this, they now have to bring it to the central uh, plant, the central factory where this is done. Uh, this is quite rudimentary too. It's quite crude as well, but it's far, far, far more advanced than, than doing it the way they were doing it before. And now they're producing a quality product that they can sell. Here's a, a close-up picture of the cane coming through this machine. We fed that, that piece into the machine and it grinded, ground it through, <clears throat> making a roar. Uh, and all, you think, picture all these hundreds of farmers bringing their bundles of, of sugar cane from their small little garden plots in. Uh, it produces a lot of, a lot of, uh, of uh, sugar. And here's the juice coming out. And this is where it gets really understandable because this is just like maple syrup. It's exactly the same process. You don't tap a tree, in this case, you squeeze the cane to get the juice, but once you've got the juice, you boil it down and it turns into sugar. It's that simple. You grind, you, you 
run it through this machine, you squeeze it, the juice comes out, they have these big vats. So we've provided them, helped them buy the stainless steel vats for boiling it, the stainless steel tank for collecting it, the, grind, the grinder crusher unit itself, all of that. And this co-op now is producing a fairly high quality sugar, which they are then able to send to town, back to the factory again. We're down out of the mountains again with this one. In this picture, they're grading sugar. They're, they're, they're cleaning any uh, contaminants out of it, but they're also breaking any lumps uh, to make it fine. In this picture, they're filling bags of sugar for sale to North America. And if you, you look really close up in the corner, you'll see a sign that says the client, the client is La Siembra in Canada. And La Siembra is a co-op in Toronto that was formed uh, a few years ago, not, not many, eight or ten years ago, La Siembra was formed, and they buy, they don't buy coffee, fair trade coffee, they buy fair trade chocolate. And they make chocolate bars, and they make uh, various other products. In fact, they are, I think, doing coffee now too, La Siembra. But this co-op was producing product for La Siembra the day we were there on tour. Now, there's a pretty good chance that they, they, they set that up on our behalf, right? But regardless, it doesn't matter uh, because they truly do sell sugar to uh, La Siembra. So here's, when I talk about business opportunities, here's an example where, and you can buy La Siembra chocolate in Moncton. And it's all about fair trade. And it's all about fair trade. It's a, that's right. So competing with the big Nestle's of the world, these guys can't really compete with the big producers in those tiny little plots of sugar cane, uh, the rudimentary equipment for grinding the cane. They cannot compete with these huge plantations that exist in Hawaii and other places of the world. But they can do this. This is a niche that they can fill. And they're doing it, and they're doing it well. Uh, here's uh, just an, another picture of the uh, of uh, coffee ready to, to be shipped back. And I, I just threw that in again just to emphasize the fact that there's hundreds of producers shipping small quantities into a central plant which is assisted by the Canadian Cooperative Association slash CDF uh, to manufacture this product. So when they say that they've helped, uh, you know, thousands of people, uh, it's true. They have helped thousands of people, or we have helped thousands of people. And then, at the end of the meeting, back up in the mountains now, uh, this fellow uh, picked up his guitar and started to sing. And he sang, and he sang, and he sang. And here you do get a sense. Uh, of the of the other, one other side of the room uh, where uh, the ladies had gathered uh, and some of the younger people had gathered and this fellow was sang he was so happy that old beat up guitar it was just awful I took a try at playing it and it was just a horrible guitar but he made it sound uh, he made it sound good there's really really happy people and they were really happy to see us imagine how, the, to have a visit from I don't know what there were six or eight or ten of us I forget how many there were of us but to have a visit from a bunch of gringos from North America would be quite a quite an event for them in that small community, and and uh, they probably partied into the wee hours of the morning. Uh, so this is the International Year of Cooperative. We are uh, running this uh, this uh, fundraising campaign called Build a Better World uh, in celebration of the United Nations International Year of Cooperatives in 2012. We CDF is launching a special campaign to raise 12 million dollars over four years, which is three or four times the amount we typically raise. So it's a very ambitious uh, fundraising product project. And I'm involved in it, Leo's involved in it, tons of other people are involved in it. Um, how, can, how can you can help, how you can help, or how can you help? Uh, the various ways, and Leo should probably speak to this. In fact, Leo, do you mind speaking to this part of the presentation? Because I'm, I'm done, and, uh, and my time is done. I see that as well. Um, and I, I really didn't come here to, to beg for money, but of course, it's a fundraising campaign, so somebody has to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will beg for money. Uh, we are going to have a series of initiatives at Co-op Atlantic. One of the things that we're doing right off the bat is we're going to be canvassing some of our suppliers to see if they can provide uh, some funds. We are going to be asking management and staff if they can donate some dollars, yes, some real dollars, uh, even if it's just five thousand uh, dollars, five thousand. <laughs> even, even if it's just five, five thousand, yes, or five dollars, uh, we'll gladly take it because there's about five thousand employees in our network, and if everybody gives five dollars, it's 
an amazing amount. So think about it. Uh, so we will be having some fundraiser raising activities here. Um, we will be at our AGM having a um, auction, a silent auction and a real auction. If you have some items that you'd want to donate, maybe an old art piece or a picture at home that uh, you think you would want to part with, we'd gladly take it and bring it to the auction. Um, we will also have some activities with our stores. So throughout the year, some of the stores are committed that they will raise funds. Uh, I have the distribution center in Gander. They've decided they wanted to be part of this, and they're kind of leading uh, an initiative in Newfoundland. Uh, and the stores have decided that the co-op week, they would all together have fundraiser, fundraising activities, the food stores, during that week. The farm stores have also committed that they would help in the effort. And we will be talking to other people that uh, have an affinity for this. It is very important to note that uh, the money that actually gets back to the communities is over 85%. So there are organizations that only give back 15% and 85% is in administration. CDF operates a model that is very different. We have a lot of volunteers like John, uh, that give their time, and people on the ground as well that don't take any salary, that make this happen. So if you want your dollars to really matter to, to the poor, this is a way of helping a long-term initiative to get them to be self-sufficient and do things for themselves that are really important to those communities. So uh, we will be involved in in the promotions and the marketing, and I'm sure John's going to be around to, to cheer us on. But I think this is a very valuable cause, and anything that you can do will help. So thank you very much. We also have some retail managers that every year, when we ask them to donate some items or ask them to come to the, uh, to the auction, they're there bidding on some stuff sometimes and raising the bids. And uh, there's a guy uh, called Fred Humber from oh, Tarrington. The little, the little uh, Tarrington man in the lobby. The little. Uh, yes. That's, he, a, that's a CDF store. He's there every year and he raises thousands of dollars because he really believes in this stuff. And uh, with old people like him, and when he pulls out his checkbook, uh, he's not given $5. He's given a lot of dollars, and it's personal. So for him, it's a personal cause. He understands uh, the importance of it. And it's great to have someone like that around. Uh, so anyway, if uh, you are interested in helping in, the, uh, in these activities, i uh, gladly uh, talk to you and see what we can do and encourage other employees as well when we start uh, advertising that, that this is going on. And you can tell them about the session we had. So thank you very much. So thank you all. Uh, closing thought. This br certainly brings it down to earth for me. Uh, poverty anywhere is a threat to prosperity everywhere. Pretty pretty simple uh, sentence, but it, it uh, speaks speaks volumes. I think. Um, I think we've run out of time. So thank you very very much for your attention and your attendance. I suppose if there were questions, we could Leo and I could try to answer them. But uh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>